This is the video lecture for biotechnology for the class that was to be held on March 8th, Friday, March 8th, 2019. Now, where we left off on Chapter 7, we um, have covered cloning, and you have been pretty much drilled that cloning and genetically modified animals are two different things. So we're going to talk about transgenic animals. So there's several ways to do animal transformation and introduce new genetic material into animals. Um, one of the easiest is to use a retrovirus. A retrovirus is a virus that produces reverse transcriptase and can take the gene of interest and incorporate it into the DNA of the host. So you take a mouse embryo um, and you uh, will treat it with a genetically modified retrovirus before the embryos are implanted into the mouse mom. And um, then that way the cells are genetically modified. That does not produce a fully uh, recombinant mouse because not all cells get modified. Uh, not all cells will be transformed. And also the size of the transgene is limited. It's a smaller transgene. Uh, you can put single genes in, but you may not be able to put like entire pathways. Another way is to do pronuclear microinjection. And this, you tend to get uh, fully transgenic animals this way because you can integrate the genetic material when the embryo is much, much younger. Okay, so um, you introduce the transgene DNA at the earliest possible stage when the zygote is just developing, so it may be just one cell, two cell, or four cells, and the DNA is just injected using a very, very small glass syringe um, directly into the nucleus of the egg, or you can transform the sperm. So with pro-nuclear microinjection, Um, here is a fertilized mouse egg before the fusion of male and female pronuclei, okay? And then you inject one of the nuclei uh, with foreign DNA. You transfer the eggs into a foster mother. And then about, um, a lot of times this won't work. So about 10 to 30% of the offspring contain the foreign DNA and then you mate the offspring that only mate the offspring that have the foreign DNA in both alleles, okay? You need to make sure that you continue to meet, mate these and breed these until you have mice that have both alleles that are transgenic. Another one is an embryonic stem cell method. And you just take embryonic stem cells that are mixed with the DNA. And then uh, when they're mixed with the DNA, they absorb the DNA naturally. There are DNA binding proteins on the cell surface. And um, you can also do sperm mediated transfer where there are linker proteins on the sperm that attach the DNA to the sperm cells. And you can also use the gene gun. Okay. Um, so you can use this to Im improve the productivity of livestock. Uh, you can create uh, milking cows that produce more milk. You can create um, animals that are larger so they have more meat. So you can increase productivity. So faster growth rates or leaner growth patterns means that um, the animals are gonna be quicker to the market and less costly. Okay, and the big question is, can these produce healthier foods? Okay, so you could look at uh, genes responsible for cholesterol production, and you could have healthy lower cholesterol eggs, although I think that this is uh, not going with some of the current science that shows that cholesterol is not really the issue in terms of heart disease. And so, you know, again, things may not be what they seem. You need to be very careful when saying this is genetically modified animal and it's more healthy um, because there are, um, you know, we've, we've adapted over ages and ages 
to eat the animals that we do eat, to eat livestock. And the bo human body is adapted to eating livestock. It seems like there are uh, better ways that you can be healthy than to genetically modify the animals that we consume. Okay. Uh, Herman is a bull that was produced by transgenic um, nuclear transfer. And he has the human gene for lactoferrin, which increases the availability of iron and milk. Now, this is interesting because Herman's a bull. He doesn't produce milk, but he does have that trait. So when Herman is bred with cows, then he can pass on that trait to milking cows. Okay, and here's a picture of Herman. He's just got humanized lactoferrin. He looks like a standard bull. Okay, animals can also be engineered to be resistant to disease. One disease is called mastitis, which is um, a staph infection in the udders of cattle. And so mastitis makes it very painful to milk, and you can't milk these cows. Um, so uh, there are genetically modified dairy cows that can resist mastitis. Uh, there are also genetically modified cows that uh, have produced lifostatin, which kill Staphylococcus aureus. Um, however, they may not be producing lifostatin at the, at the level that it needs to be to fully protect the animals. Another type of animal that has been produced is the enviro pig. One of the problems with pig feces is that there's a whole lot of phosphate in pig fecal material. And so um, they, these pigs will express the enzyme phytase in the saliva. And this degrades the phosphate in the pigs so pigs produce substantially less phosphorus in the urine and the feces. So their uh, phosphates usually just go through the pig's body and end up in the urine and the feces, but this breaks down the phosphorus so it becomes nutritionally available. It gets incorporated into the pig instead of going out as waste product. Uh, so it cuts down on the um, phosphorus problem. Phosphorus leads to eutrophication and eutrophication then will kill streams and rivers. Okay, and phosphorus is the major uh, pollutant generated on pig farms, so this is very important. Okay, in terms of food safety, um, you can produce transgenic animals that um, reduce food poisoning deaths because the animals are not um, culturing microbes that cause food poisoning. Okay, you can also reduce the use of antibiotics in agriculture. But when you have antimicrobial genes, then you, there's always a possibility that those antimicrobial genes can cut, hop to gut flora. We've talked about this before. So when they do hop to gut flora, uh, then all of a sudden you've got humans that are producing antimicrobials in their gut flora, and that may not be such a good thing. Okay, and also genetically modified animals uh, serve as bioreactors, so they can produce proteins. This is primarily for protein pharmaceuticals, and so you can take very, very valuable proteins and produce them in the milk of mammals. Okay. So the gene for the desired protein is just introduced via transgenics into the target cell. And then the cell is raised to become an adult animal. And you can do this by traditional breeding, but a lot of times it's done by cloning, where you just take the uh, cell that has been transformed, you clone it uh, using pro-nuclear injection into a fertile egg, and then you produce the clone that has that trait. And then you can produce milk or sometimes eggs. Uh, you have genetically modified chickens that will produce valuable proteins in the eggs. And these are rich in the desired protein. Okay. And uh, a lot of times it's, it's great to produce transgenic cattle, but they take a long time to uh, mature to be, before they become lactational. So um, 
Goats are used instead because they mature more quickly, they can become uh, gestationally active, and then can start to produce milk. So if we want to produce uh, transgenic cattle, let's say um, we took human immune genes um, and produced uh, genetically modified cells that uh, produce the human immune repertoire, then we could knock out the bovine immune genes uh, while it's still in the petri dish, and then we produce uh, animals that have the human immune repertoire. And when you do that, and they've done this with mice, uh, this is the examples being shown for cattle, but when you do this with mice, then when the mice B cells are um, exposed to antigens, then they'll produce human antibodies. Okay, so you just uh, expand the herd, then you immunize with some type of antigen, and then you collect the serum. Okay, serum is just a liquid portion from clotted blood. And then you can peer out polyclonal antibodies. Polyclonal, because there are many different clones of the antibodies that are being produced. Okay, and here is a transgenic goat that produces um, a therapeutic called Atrin to alpha antithrombin. Okay. Um, some goats have been genetically modified to produce um, spider silk, okay, and spider silk is very strong on, you know, when you look at a gram per gram basis, it's very strong and very resistant, and the spider silk is used in order to make bulletproof vests, okay. Um, Atrin, which is alpha antithrombin, is needed for people that have an antithrombin um, deficiency and so this is produced in genetically modified pygmy goats and the pygmy goats then produce the atrin uh, protein directly in their milk and they can be milked and then the protein is purified okay some genetically modified animals are knockouts and if you want to see what a gene does or a gene function is then the easiest way to do that is to knock out the function of the gene and see what happens in the animal, okay? So this is primarily in mice, and there are mouse lines with every gene has been knocked out. So you can buy a mouse on the internet for any mouse gene being knocked out, as long as the mouse is still alive. Some genes are lethal if you knock them out, so obviously you can't do those, okay? Um, and so homologous recombination is used. In homologous recombination, um, you take DNA, uh, you add it to embryonic stem cells, and it recombines with the existing gene to knock it out or to, to actually loop it out. Okay. Then you produce these, take these mod modified embryonic stem cells, and they introduce into the normal embryo. Uh, so you have a chimera. It's part genetically modified and part not. Okay, and the mouse pup, as I said, this is known as what is called a chimera. And a chimera means that since we uh, implanted embryonic stem cells in existing embryos, only those embryonic stem cells are gonna be genetically modified. So some cells are normal and some cells are knockouts. So it may take some breeding. You actually have to back cross these mice in order to get uh, full knockout mice. Some animals are knock-in animals, where instead of just looping out the gene of interest, you knock in the human gene of interest to replace their own counterpart. So instead of having uh, pig insulin or mouse insulin, then you would have human insulin, and that would knock in to replace the insulin gene. Okay. So you take the target gene, and you add an antibiotic resistance gene uh, marker, always have a resistance marker so you can develop the transgenic animals. Okay, you um, then have embryonic stem cells that you got from mouse. Okay, 
And by homologous recombination, you can insert a gene. Okay, this will just go into the chromosome and replace a particular gene or interrupt a particular gene. So here you have a cell with interrupted gene. Uh, you can have nonspecific recombination. These are all done in different trials. This isn't, isn't all done at the same time, which this figure tends to imply, but it's not done at the same time. So you can have nonspecific recombination where you have uh, random insertion. So you have cells with random insertion patterns, or you can have no recombination. So you have cells with no insertion. Then you just collect the cells, and then only the cells that have the interrupted gene um, that can carry, carry the antibiotic resistance marker and also another marker called TK, which uh, is going to identify if the gene's been disrupted, okay? And so you only, uh, you grow in functional media and that um, kills the cells with the functional TK gene, but if they have a disrupted TK gene, then they survive. Okay, and then you take these embryonic stem cells, micro-inject them into a mouse embryo, and then you have a knockout. So this allows us to study human diseases in animals, things like diabetes, cystic fibrosis, and muscular dystrophy. It also helps us to be able to correct the defect and do things like gene therapy. Okay, and the breast cancer mouse was patented. They actually can patent these animals in 1988 by Harvard University, and it's also been used to test new breast cancer drugs and therapies. Okay, it also produced monoclonal antibodies in animals. And this is where a mouse or a rat is inoculated with the antigen to which the antibody is desired. And then you harvest the spleen after the immune response is produced. So you get spleen cells, you get um, antibody producing spleen cells, okay? And then you fuse them with a type of cancer cell called a myeloma cell. And the myeloma cell no longer produces um, its own antibody. You actually have altered that so it doesn't produce an antibody of its own. But it's an, it, it, typically a myeloma is an antibody secreting tumor. Okay, and then you um, actually mix the antibody producing cells with the myeloma cells and you mix them directly together with a, with a compound called polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol will cause the cell membranes of the two cells to fuse. And then the resulting hybridoma has characteristics of the myeloma cell, so it grows rapidly and continuously like a tumor. And then it also has uh, the characteristic of this antibody producing spleen cells, so it produces a single type of antibody. And then you can harvest these cells, these hybridomas, and you can use them to treat cancer, um, heart disease. You can actually block transplant rejection by having anti-antibody antibodies, and those will um, block the antibodies that are responsible for transplant rejection. Okay, so what you do here is you take the spleen cells, you inoculate the mouse with an antigen, and then you take the spleen and harvest it and isolate the spleen cells. You take myeloma cells that no longer produce antibody and you fuse them and then you get cells that are part antibody producing and then part myeloma. Okay, then you sort these out in individual plates so each single hybridoma gets its own single well and you culture these, and then every well produces a single type of antibody because it came from a single cell. And then you test the antibodies for their strength, um, and then you propagate positive clones, and then you can isolate monoclonal antibodies for specific antigens. Okay. Now, mouse hybridomas can produce what's called HAMA. HAMA is human anti-mouse antibody response. Okay, so human anti-mouse antibody. Uh, and in this response, then you start to raise up antibodies in your own system that uh, are anti-mouse. And so that blocks mouse antibodies. So you can use antibodies in different organisms besides mice, and that will help. There's also uh, efforts to humanize mice. That will also help. And let's pause here while I bring up the next slide. 
Okay, the next chapter is on DNA fingerprinting and forensic analysis. So in this chapter, we're going to focus on how DNA is collected uh, from different specimens and then also analyzed to identify things like perpetrators of crimes and also for things like paternity and also to identify things like animals. Okay, so we'll first do an introduction and talk about what a DNA fingerprint is, how you identify a DNA fingerprint, depending on whether it comes from nuclear genomic DNA or mitochondrial DNA. Talk about how a DNA fingerprint is prepared, and then how DNA is put to use in situation of legal cases, and also what the rules of evidence are for DNA. And then how DNA is used to uh, establish familial relationships and DNA profiles. Uh, and that way, if for things like paternity cases. And then we'll talk about uh, non-human DNA analysis when you're looking at animals and say things like anthropology where animals may be involved. Okay. So forensic science is really an intersection between law and science when you're looking at forensic evidence in order to establish the identity of an individual or the presence of an individual at a particular site. Okay. And even in the 1800s, uh, photography became um, available. And in the 1800s, then if you had photographic evidence of somebody committing a crime, then that could be admissible. So you can identify somebody based on their photograph. In the early 1900s, then uh, scientists used fingerprints and fingerprint analysis. And then in 1985, then by DNA sequencing, then they found DNA fingerprinting uh, based on somebody's unique genetic makeup. So anything that we leave behind uh, at a particular area or scene, then will establish our presence at that particular uh, scene just because of our DNA fingerprint. So we all have a unique set of genes um, and the order of base pairs is definitely different. Okay, and every cell that we have um, contains a complete set of DNA and that identifies the organism as a whole. Now, most of that DNA is very similar because we only differ by one tenth of 1% uh, in terms of our genome. Okay, so there are two main types of tests. One focuses on the length of the different fragments that are produced. And so if you have a large amount of DNA, then you can cut the DNA with restriction enzymes. And then depending on the, the region of the DNA, then some people will have different length polymorphisms. Okay, this does require a larger amount of DNA. So you need things like blood uh, or skin. And the DNA cannot be degraded, so you can't really take DNA from uh, rotting bone or something like that um, to do re restriction fragment length polymorphisms. Okay, it also do PCR. PCR will establish uh, sequence identity, requires much less DNA, uh, and the DNA can be partially degraded. Um, but it's also, if you have a contaminant, if somebody uh, in the evidence chain uh, contaminates it with their own DNA, then it can be extremely se sensitive. So then you start to see uh, evidences of other humans that have interacted with the sample. So uh, a DNA fingerprint can just be established with a gel. So let's say somebody uh, individual one, you cut their DNA with a cutting enzyme and they produce three fragments, W, X, and Y. And then uh, individual two only produces two fragments where they have a very long one, Z, and then they have another one, Y, which is identical to the first. So you can take, you know, these different restriction patterns and then identify individuals with these restriction patterns. And if you have good DNA, this is a good way to do it. Okay, uh, you're only looking at a small portion of the genome because generally the genome is identical in humans. So you're looking at regions that are more variable in humans. Uh, 
Uh, one thing that you can do is you can look at variable number of tandem repeats. And these are just repeated sequences. It's almost like a record skipping where just um, you get A, T, C, A, T, C. You get the same, same uh, triplet pair or same quadruplet pair that will just repeat over uh, ex long expanses of DNA. And each person has some variable number tandem repeats inherited from mother and some from father. And so for each region where you find variable number tandem repeats, then there will be two numbers that identify that person, one from mom and one from dad. Okay. And here is a, uh, a variable tandem repeat called a microsatellite. And you can see two flanking sequences that generally, they're pretty heterogeneous. Flanking sequence over here that's general, heter generally heterogeneous. And then a TTA sequence that is um, eight triplets long. So you got TTA, TTA, and so forth. And so this microsatellite region identifies the number of repeats as eight for this particular individual. And that's just on a single chromosome. Okay, and so there are tandem repeats. They're called short tandem repeats. They're not variable number tandem repeats here, but we just call them short tandem repeats. And there are 13 different short tandem repeats that are identified, and they're used as a library of DNA fingerprints. Uh, each tandem repeat has a specific number, has a specific address based on linkage mapping here. And then, um, then it's read into a database called CODIS. This is an FBI database uh, called combined, combined DNA Index System. And if you commit a felony and you're convicted of a felony, then your information goes up on the CODIS database so you could, they can track you nationwide just based on your short tandem repeats. Okay, so in terms of preparing a DNA fingerprint, First, you have to collect a specimen. So anything that is a source of DNA um, can also be a source of contamination. So you have to be very careful not to contaminate the sample. Okay, and you have to be gloved up, change them frequently. Um, all instruments have to be disposable. You can't talk, sneeze, or cough because you're spreading your own DNA. Uh, avoid touching any item that contain DNA, so you have to keep your hands off of your face, nose, and mouth. And then make sure that you air dry the evidence because any moisture is going to promote mold growth, and mold growth can contaminate the sample and also degrade the DNA. Okay. Uh, evident sunlight and high temperature will destroy evidence because you start to get photo degradation of the DNA. Uh, bacteria also starts to contaminate the DNA, so you've got contamination in your sample, and then moisture will cause mold growth. And you have to realize that this is a comparative process. So you've got crime scene DNA, and you're comparing the crime scene DNA with suspect DNA. And so if you've got good samples, if you have like fresh whole blood, like leukocytes that are nuclear blood cells, they have nuclei. Um, and if the DNA has been retrieved and analyzed from an old sample, then you have to use PCR in order to amplify the sample. Okay, then you extract the DNA. You can purify it chemically using detergents, or you can mechanically purify it. You can use something like a French press that will force the DNA out of the cell, so, but you do need to get a pure sample. And you can use PCR to amplify the DNA in the crime scene. Um, so you just take flanking regions based on the CODIS site, um, and then that will amplify uh, specific uh, short tandem repeat sites so you can identify individuals using the CODIS database. And so when you do this, this is just your classical PCR. You've got um, your original target DNA region, and then that will multiply the target DNA region. You do this for every CODA site. Remember, there are 13 different CODA sites. Okay, and then after this, the STRs are amplified by PCR. 
then the alleles can be separate, separated and detected using uh, electrophoresis. Don't use gels here, you just use capillary electrophoresis, and that allows the number of repeats of each of the two alleles um, on different chromosomes to be determined. Okay, and then you get something like this. And depending on when they come out of the chromatography column, then you get two peaks per short tandem repeat, and that will tell you the number, relative number of short tandem repeats of each one of these regions. And the number of repeats within a short tandem repeat is referred to as the allele. So that's the allele number. For example, uh, D7S 820 short tandem repeat on chromosome 7 uh, has between 5 and 16 repeats of GATA, this uh, tetramer. Okay, so individual with um, alleles 10 and 15, that means they have 10 repeats on one chromosome and 15 repeats on the other chromosome. Then they had 10 GATA repeats from one parent and then 10, 15 GATA repeats from the other parent. Okay, and so since there are 12 different alleles for this particular short tandem repeat, then that means you can, you know, have somewhere between five and 16. So there's 12 different combinations. Then you take that and you look at the combinations of the two, then that uh, means that you have a, uh, 78 possible genotypes. So the odds that um, somebody has, you have two individuals on the earth that will have the same DNA profile with using the 13 sh short tandem repeat regions is more than one in a billion. So uh, we have almost 8 billion people. So there are uh, chances that you can identify two individuals that have the same genotype based on short tandem repeats, but it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. Okay, so when we put DNA to use, we collect the evidence from a crime scene, and then we compare that with the suspect. We also need to compare it with the victim because the victim is going to have cells at the crime scene as well. Okay, and testing continues until a difference is found between the suspect and the crime scene. And if no dif difference is found after a statistical acceptable amount of tests, then the probability of a match is high, then you've identified the presence of somebody at the crime scene. Okay, so we, we, here we have Jane Doe and Dorothy Smith, um, and we're looking at their different regions. Okay, and you have knife blade stain A and knife blade stain B, and you can see that this sample matches up more appropriately um, with Jane Doe because she's got the same short tandem repeat numbers as the knife blade stains. Knife blade stains are consistent and they're consistent with her short tandem repeats. At this point, we can eliminate Dorothy Smith because she does have different regions on FGA, VWA, and so forth. Okay, so the first time that this was used was in what was called the Narboro Village Murders. This was in the UK, um, and genetic fingerprinting was used in a criminal case. This was the sexual assault and a murder of a girl in the United Kingdom, and the prime subsect, suspect's DNA did not match that of the crime scene, um, and the police collected a lot of samples from the area population of life, likely suspects, and it found out, they had found out later that the uh, person who was implicated in the crime actually was giving DNA samples from another person, okay? So a friend of the suspect has actually slipped his sample in, um, usually this is whole blood, and that sample then was incorrectly identified, but once they correctly identified and subpoenaed the person's blood, then they found that they indeed committed the crime. So you take the specimen, okay, you add detergent, 
uh, you incubate it over a night in a refrigerator at four degrees Celsius. Okay. Then you center, centrifuge and discard the supernatant. And you add extract detergent without dithiothreonine. Uh, okay, incubate for about two hours. And then save the supernatant. This will contain uh, female DNA. Okay. And then you add extract of detergent containing dithiothreonine, and this will get sperm DNA. Okay, so you can get male and female DNA from this. So say if you've got somebody that's um, uh, been swabbed using a rape kit, then in that particular instance, then they can identify the female uh, as well as the male perpetrator. Um, DNA evidence was first used in the United States in 1987. Um, and it's led to overturning of false convictions. So um, when uh, evidence uh, was contaminated or um, evidence showed that the perpetrator was not at the crime scene, then they were able to overturn convictions. And this is just an example of this, where they looked at um, one particular STR for a person and identified the person who was at the crime scene and the one who was not. Okay, and eyewitness testimony can be tricky, okay? DNA testing is gen in general is more reliable. Uh, Victor Lopez was tried for sexual assault on three women. Um, they reported that he was black, it was also dark during the sexual assault, so it's very hard to tell, but Lopez's DNA was a match to the crime scene. Okay, and then also looking at uh, uh, combating terrorism or uh, natural disaster force. So um, they use DNA techniques to identify the remains of crime, of the World Trade Center bombing, uh, or yeah, bombing, excuse me. Um, and they had to retrieve tissue samples and from these tissue samples then would use forensic DNA um, and they would match that to the DNA of missing persons. They would do things like um, take somebody's comb and just take pieces of hair and look at the mitochondrial DNA on the hair and then match that up with the DNA of the tissue samples. And um, they had to develop new strategies for the World Trade Center just because of the volume of the people that need to be identified. And um, they would compare them with DNA profiles either from artifacts from that person themselves or from whole blood that was taken from relatives. Okay, and in the World Trade Center disaster, within 24 hours, collection points had been established around the city. So families of missing persons could do cheek swabs or uh, uh, contribute personal items like a toothbrush from the missing people. Uh, and this uh, involves several companies that and they develop new software programs to match the samples. And they primarily, primarily use short tandem repeats, which you can do with like a cheek swab, uh, mitochondrial DNA for uh, hair samples, and then SNP analysis. Okay, and the tsunami uh, in lower Southeast Asia. Okay, uh, this was in Indonesia. There were over almost a quarter of a million lives lost, and they used short tandem repeats on uh, the Y chromosome as well as mitochondrial DNA and were able to identify 800 of the victims of the tsunami. Let me check on time here really quick. I think that's good. I think I'm going to call it good for this particular lecture. We'll talk about uh, DNA and the rules of evidence when we're back in class on Monday.